Hey, welcome to TFTC Live. This is my podcast. Actually, it's not live. It is is lightly edited, as today is also lightly edited, not by much. Things are great here in the southeastern U.S. I'm having a great time getting my runs here in the morning. And with some low humidity, this spring has been great. But I, I could tell summer's heating up. It's coming in. It's creeping in. And uh, it's no different. I've been here many moons and just very used to that. But it's just, it's, uh, it's always tough. It really is. Today is a fun one. I get to speak with an author and I don't get to speak with too many authors. And these authors usually write about something in music. Today's no different. It's with Warren Zanes, not Haynes, Zanes, Warren Zanes who's in a band called the Del Fuegos out of Boston. They were pretty big back in the 1980s. Good band. Really, really good band. They were featured in a Miller beer commercial from what I remember. Anyway, Warren just came out with a book that is so good. It's called Deliver Me From Nowhere. And it's about the making of Bruce Springsteen's classic album called Nebraska. Kind of buried away in that catalog of uh, Mr. Springsteen's, but it is very bare bones. It was done in a room in New Jersey, just doing a bunch of demos. He didn't realize that really he was putting together an album. And it's a fascinating story about how it all comes together. Warren sat down with, with Bruce and those who were close to him and talk about how really something that was so personal really went out there into wide release and then inspired a lot of people. It, it was inspired by a lot of things. And then he inspired a lot of people after that musicians and, and creative types alike after that. So we have a great discussion and we have what's uh, called a Cleveland connection. I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. So we kind of touch on that. He actually was um, involved with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We talk a little bit about that and uh, some of the haunts around Cleveland. He really loves the uh, Arts Museum and, and so much more. And I talk about the times I've seen Bruce in Cleveland. He's pretty big there. You know, outside of New Jersey, Cleveland's a pretty big market for Bruce Springsteen. Also saw him quite a bit here in Atlanta. But yeah, Cleveland just uh, really loves uh, an artist like Bruce Springsteen. Definitely has done very, very well. So we get into that. Uh, it's it's a fun time. I hope you enjoy. Good morning. Right. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, good morning. How's it going? Where are you at right now? I'm in Montclair, New Jersey, sitting in my... Uh, uh, home uh with no children present and a dog at my side yeah speaking of kids my daughter lives in elizabeth new jersey she's been there since last september ah uh, yeah nice little place there and she is dating somebody from freehold new jersey which i never would right. have expected it's a small yeah. world <laughs> um, surely there's some parental influence there yeah exactly i mean the minute i heard that i said springsteen country <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Well, more yeah. more than Springsteen Country, Springsteen Capital City. Yeah, I bet I have yet to come up there, so uh, I definitely have to check that out. You had come out with this wonderful book detailing and chronicling the making of the classic LP, Nebraska. What's the original idea for that? The original idea was, um, you know, something of a personal obsession driving me to turn this obsession into a book and it was was really based on questions i had questions about why i felt so connected to the record and the lingering question held over from 1982 of why an artist at the top of their game would put out a record that was so at odds with the marketplace and so confusing to many fans. It was it just it was one of the strangest moves in the history of popular music. And and that stayed with me. And I and I felt like despite what I knew, I didn't fully understand why he did it. And despite what I knew about myself, I did I didn't fully understand why I connected with the desperate people in the songs of Nebraska. 
Yeah, 15 tracks, pretty much did it all on a home-based system that his engineer had gotten. It's a really interesting story how all that came together. For us, it would have been like, oh my gosh, this is a really expensive piece of equipment. But for them, it was just like, you know, downgraded from your usual studio equipment. Yes and no on would it have been expensive to us? Yeah, I mean, it was still under $1,000. So, you know, it was a, a pretty real piece of gear, but for consumer audio, they're, they're the audiophile types who would go out and spend some serious cash getting a good home stereo. So this fit into that category, but as you say, it didn't fit into the category of commercial recording equipment, which was all that Springsteen had ever worked with in making records. Yeah, and these many years later, I mean, it sounds great. It's just bare bones. It's just, it's amazing how they were able to just do this in a bedroom in that township in New Jersey. And just, it, it's just so real. I, taking that huge left turn like that really must have been, you know, jarring to fans, but not so much to him. He, it sounds like he really had to find himself and he was going through a lot at that time. I think he was in a jarring time. So jarring to everybody. Uh, he, he didn't, this is the only official release of Springsteen's that he made not knowing he was making an official release. So the intention behind it was not to make his next record. He was just making demos at home. And I think there's, you know, I try to get into this in the book. Uh, it's just like if if you're, you know, talking with somebody on the street, you're going to get a cup of coffee and you're talking to your neighbor, you're going to have one kind of conversation. If suddenly there's a film crew there, uh, that conversation is going to be much more probably stilted, awkward, uncomfortable. There's this awareness of the camera. And the equivalent of that in recording is like Springsteen made a record not knowing there are any eyes or ears on him. And so you got something that you could only get that way. So it was it had this intimacy that is impossible to achieve when the self-consciousness is raised yeah and on this you got vocals the acoustic guitar electric guitar harmonica glockenspiel how did he get into using all of that i mean was he pretty much just self-taught with that did he talk about how he had he had to use all these elements to to create this well the, uh, you, what you just described is far less than he was accustomed to i mean this this yeah. This wasn't a lot. This was a lot less, you know, because when you go into a professional recording situation, you're even just in the territory of keyboards alone. Uh, you have a wide range of possibilities. This was much more narrow. It was one acoustic guitar, one electric guitar, harmonica. You know, he, he there was a reason for the glockenspiel, but it was also just what he had around. It's, it's a demo mentality. Yeah. And then he was walking around with the cassette, just like in his back pocket. No, not, not, not even the cover people who know about cassettes these days, but yet yeah, it's not even protected. And just like, it's, it's just amazing how that that had turned into an actual release. Yeah. It's that, that, you know, that's what compelled me is there's only one story that I know of like this you know pe people did start recording at home more and more once you had you know g that that fit the home um but there was still a much higher level of care you know if, if springsteen put this tape in his back pocket and sat on it and crushed it it was the only one there it would have been gone and yeah wasn't thinking about that. Um, he didn't know that he was going to get to some impasse where this crappy cassette was the next record. I would say it never did sound like a professional release. You know, it, it's the truth is like it doesn't, you know, by, you know, professional audio standards, it's not a good sounding record. Yeah. And it's the audio perfect. file can tell you, yeah. Yeah, it's and you know anybody at a even if they didn't have deep technical knowledge, anybody at a record label who's 
sees the artist come in the door and says, this is my next record, and then listens to something like Nebraska, will go, there's something fundamentally wrong with this picture. But yes. Bruce Springsteen, you know, this was album number six. He was in a position where the, the record label wasn't going to say, we're not taking it. It's the next Springsteen record. But they were going to go, oh, shit, what do we do with this? There's no pretending that somebody could put that recording through any kind of device and make the problems go away. Yeah. The, the, the magic of it is that he went, this recording is better as rough as it is than anything I can do to make it better. Like the spirit of the thing is in this version that doesn't sound great, that has mistakes, that isn't finished. And, you know, there's a big message to creators. Like sometimes making it better doesn't make it better. Yeah. And they discover that with the electric uh, Nebraska sessions as well. And yeah. they're like, yeah, this magic is gone. It's just organic. Yeah, they tried all kind. They tried all kinds of things, and they just kept going back to this cassette that was was really, you know, in my, the image I have in my head is like that cassette sitting at the middle of a table with industry professionals in a circle around it, and the cassette saying, "I know better than all of you," and. It's Springsteen who says, let's just let the cassette talk. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the influences are there too, especially with the film Badlands, which is just, you know, this you know, really disturbing film, Martin Sheen, that came out 50 years ago now. It's just that had a, a good influence. And uh, the band Suicide, I'm really just like amazed. You know, you wouldn't have expected those kind of uh, influences, but they're there. And and you go through in detail in the book about how that that's helped shape uh, the record at that time. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think Springsteen's a really you know, from a writer's perspective, he's he's a great artist to write about because his level of kind of absorption that he could take, if something was interesting to him out there on the horizon, uh, the way he would take it in, the way he does take it in is, is really amazing. So there weren't a lot of artists who were thinking about, well, nobody was really thinking about the band Suicide who was working yeah. in Springsteen's area, but you didn't have artists thinking about Flannery O'Connor's short stories or Robert Frank's photographs. But Springsteen was like, I want to, I want to see what else music can do. How far can you extend the, the possibilities? And what can I learn from that exists out there that will help guide me? So, you know, Terrence Malick's Badlands, Flannery O'Connor's stories. These are these are reference points that allowed him to create this collection of songs that really are stories that are pretty far out of the 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 pocket of where popular music was at at that time. You know, I think it's really helpful if you go to 1982 and you look at the charts. Yeah, you, look what was look on there. Look at what was on the charts when yeah. Nebraska came out. And you then, you know, do a little listening, comparison. There's just nothing like it, not even close. Yeah, and and it was. It was such a different era, the, the early Reagan era, where it was becoming morning in America again. And here's somebody with something so dark. It's just, you know, it really just rips the whole lid off of the the gloss that was being created at that time. Yeah, our artists can give um, perspectives like that. That's something they do for us. You know, sometimes that perspective is very personal and it helps us navigate a breakup or troubles at home. Sometimes that perspective is both personal, but also societal. And we can see an America that's very different from the one being portrayed by you know, the man in the Oval Office. And Springsteen has many times in his career used his position to give a perspective that's both rattling to 
you know, the people living in, in that world, but also really important so that we don't lose a sense of like what's going on out there. So it's it's the kind of innately political, but often not overtly political. Yeah, it's so bold and honest because at that time it was about, you know, electronic uh, entertainment and glossing things over. Like I was saying, it was just um, I think he was like saying he was influenced by Howard Zinn, who was just this really in, in you know, incredible writer and just really told the truth. And that 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 takes a lot of guts to do that. And he's still doing it, Bruce Springsteen. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not a big uh, believer in truth, capital T. Uh, you know, I think everybody's truth is um, it's 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 not a thing of purity. It's like it's it's a determined truth, but. In my life, I've often gone with Springsteen's truth way before I've gone with the truths that are imposed on me in a really top-down fashion. And I think I think he's done that for a lot of people. Since the late 60s, I think yeah. there are a lot of us who will go to our music for our truths rather than the world of politics. Yeah. It really is. I like this one quote you use. America is the home of hucksterism and extreme salesmanship that Russell Banks said. And that's pretty much what was birthing born in the USA, which became one of the biggest selling albums in the 80s. It's you know, it, he had to get there. It, it seems like doing Nebraska helped him get to born in the USA. Yeah, I th I, you know, that was that was another thing that really motivated me was. And Springsteen said this to me, you know, in, in our conversations was Nebraska and Born in the USA are as far apart from one another as any albums in his catalog. The odd thing is that they were released one after the other. So there's the full scope. And I really did have that. It wasn't an informed understanding, but I had that feeling of like, surely the one Nebraska helped make the other possible. Like he went, you know, he went far enough down into the dirt to be able to then come that far up into the spotlight. Like somehow he needed to do the one. And the book was about exploring why that was the case and, and what it was doing for him psychologically, what it was doing for him artistically. Yeah, and selling Nebraska was, you know, somewhat of a feat in itself. Walter Yenzikoff seemed to be kind of off the charts at that point. So you had to go to the second guy in command, Al Teller at the record company. So that that actually helped, I think, with John Lando getting involved and helped selling this you know, yeah, record. But, yeah. yeah, mostly there, there was no selling. It was much more making available. Yeah, um, because Springsteen didn't do any interviews after he released Nebraska. Right. He didn't. It was the first time he didn't tour to support a record. Um, when you look at the promotional campaign, it was really lean. Um, it, they didn't try to say Nebraska was something that it wasn't. So it was like they reduced the campaign, made it super bare bones to get as close to matching the product as they could. And then Born in the USA by comparison was, you know, a full on, we're taking this to the marketplace and no shame in that. It's just, yeah. uh, it's different kind of, di a different push. But they knew with Born in the USA, they had something they could not just take to radio, but take to radio and kill whereas nebraska it's like they knew that you know there would be one-offs where people played it on radio but you couldn't get a radio hit with a record like that yeah. it had atlantic city which i guess was considered the single and a video which didn't even have him in there arnold levine great uh director and that, you know, at that time, I mean, Bruce Springsteen wasn't doing the videos, but, you know, with Born in the USA, then it started to take off. 
But before that, I was like, he seemed almost like an underground artist to people like in my generation was like, we knew the name, but we didn't uh, see you know him all over MTV until, you know, 1984 and then beyond. Yeah, well, and, and MTV was it was was young, very, very young. Um, uh, by 84, it was uh, it was established as, uh, you know, for the first time you could break artists without radio. MTV could break an artist and suddenly you saw art departments mattering in a way that they never had. But, yeah. you know, in 82, people were starting to MTV was it gained steam really quickly. Uh, and artists were seeing like if, you know, Tom Petty's a great example. He happened to have videos in the can and he was just an unlikely video artist. But since he already had videos in the can, he was in a great position with MTV. Uh, you know, so. Nebraska is also really at odds at that with that moment of people going, how can we make this visual? How yeah. can we make ourselves into televisual beings? And Springsteen was going in the opposite direction, but he would, yes, turn back for Born in the USA. Yeah, Nebraska is just about isolation being at one. So that was just like totally, yeah, totally, like you say, at, at odds with what was going on with MTV and what was going on in America. But uh, Nebraska did inspire others like Roseanne Cash. And Johnny Cash actually ended up covering Highway Patrolman. And just uh, that that just shows you how much of a, of a great influence it had, not just on the Cashes, but like, going forward a lot of other artists were inspired by nebraska yeah i think it's one it's it's it became a reference point for people who write songs and make records um you know it's really the the force of the the you know i you know i don't want to say like the force of the music industry it's the force of the world we live in is like grow it if you if you open a bakery the point isn't to keep it right where it is. There's this imperative, like grow it, grow it. Yeah. Just open a second location. And so music is not outside of that capitalist model. Uh, and, you know, even in our individual lives, we think that, you know, is your home a little bit better than the one you grew up in? There's just this force that we live in that is, we often don't see it, but in music, it's there. And, you know, each record should be a, a growth and that can kill an artist. So a lot of people looked at Springsteen had just had his first number one record with the river and had his first top 10 single. And like every voice is saying, grow it, grow it now, make it bigger. And he chose to make it way smaller. And I think for artists, there was an enormous kind of shot of freedom and seeing someone make that choice at such a high level, say, I'm going to make this about just the rudiments of my art. You're going to mm. hear me writing songs. There's no production is going to bury it. And so over time, a lot of artists were inspired by it. And like, really the message was sometimes you just strip it all back and say, I'm not listening to the demands. I'm not listening to what, you know, the trajectory should be. I'm just going to go all the way back to the essential elements of what I do and see what that does for me. And for a lot of artists, it may not be their biggest selling records if they do that, but it might be the one that's, you know, most meaningful artistically. Yeah. How long did it take you to do this project from start to finish? Um, I'm terrible with with dates and stuff, but I, I actually wrote the book twice um, because I wrote one that is two times as long as the one that got put out. And my editor and my agent both, you know, came to me and said, uh, we don't think this is the book you meant to write. 
and uh, you know that's a that's a tough day for any writer you know because right. there's only one way to hear it and that is my book just got rejected yeah uh, you know they weren't yeah. doing that you know I, I had a contract the, they wanted the book but uh you know they were right and 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 what i'd done that i was a mistake was i wrote and i didn't share anything with anybody it was like i went i went into a cave uh i forgot to build a fire and I started just writing a book. And when I was done, I came out of that cave and, uh, you know, like blinded by the daylight and uh, a little disoriented. And I had a book that meant something to me, the guy at the end of the cave, but it didn't mean what it needed to for the people out in the daylight. So I took the first book and I made it into... Uh, it was a play. I drew material from it, but I started with a new page one and I wrote oh, this book. And, oh my gosh. you know, in, in the end, it was they gave me really good guidance. And uh, I think sometimes that's that's just the process. Like the, the first one got me to the second one. And so it, it took. It wasn't a breeze, uh, yeah. you know, but but getting to economy is not always easy it helps you get them to make it readable and you know, or or in the case of in listenable if you're doing a, an audiobook so that yeah that definitely helps but it's tough because yeah it's kind of like having your own baby and then they're being involved with uh, the process of actually birthing it so yeah that's it's a lot of work i'm sure it is yeah. so how many hours did you spend in, in cold snack and then sitting down with, with Springsteen? Um, for, for the book, we just did a day of interviews and, you know, but then I, I, you know, I added at the end after he read the manuscript, um, I, you know, I gave it to John Landau and then I gave it to Bruce and uh, they were, you know, really great in, in helping me from that point forward and uh that was when i asked bruce he, he said you know what can i do to help and and i said i can't find the house like i want to see the house where you yeah. did this uh and you know because it was all done in his bedroom and i I just i needed to see the place and he i i got a call and he went and he went back to it he hadn't been there in 40 years and called from the house and said hey I, you know i talked to the guy who owns it and he's the same guy who rented it to me 40 years ago and he said i can bring you out here and so i went out to bruce's house again and he drove me over to the nebraska house and, and took me in there and um that was the that was how the process ended and i you know i i couldn't dream up a better way to to bring closure to to my own experience of writing about this record, you know, going in the room where it was done with the guy who did it was, you know, a, a deep and meaningful moment. And, um, you know, this is where he's a, he's a pretty special guy and see thinking, you know, really thinking what would help this writer and you know he's a creator so he can and he, and he thinks about you know obviously he wrote a great book he can think about books he can think about music and he can think about the creator's need and to be on the receiving end of that sensitivity where he understood like you know get this guy into the room where it was done tell him what the room was like you know he gave me my last few pages and he gave me a sense of like, okay, I got it. This book is ready to go out. Yeah, I could totally feel it. I'm so glad that you did that and you went there and I, it felt like I, I could be in that room and just like, you know, was that Bruce's padded cell? Was that like a, a closed in kind of situation? You could really kind of feel it. And so that, that really does help. So you um, there's a little bit of a Cleveland connection here because I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, and you did some work in Cleveland, Ohio. There was a point at which I was going to be a 
professor. You know, I was a, a freshly minted PhD. And then I simultaneously wrote a book in the 33 and a third series about Dusty and Memphis. And, and then there was an article in the New York Times about me and my brother. And, you know, we were in the group the Del Fuegos yes. together. And so there was this kind of like it looked like a tangle but from the perspective of the hiring committee at the rock and roll hall of fame it was a confluence not a tangle so they saw a guy who was writing about music who had a phd who was still making records and they needed a vice president of education and programs and it was a real it was a hard decision i'll, I'll tell you the truth um because it was a real job. And yeah. I I thought, wow, do I want to be, do I want a desk in an office place, even if it's the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? And I felt I was giving something up and I was wrong. It, it was like, it was a great opportunity for me. And it got me, it got me closer to the world of the artists. And I was able to keep making records. So, uh, it it was a a really important job. I didn't I wasn't in that position for too long. Um, you know, I had a young family, and uh, you know, it was it was hard for my then wife to be in Cleveland, and so we ended up coming back. Um, but it was a it was a great time. You know, when I think of Cleveland, I think of taking my kids to the art museum, which is one of the greatest collections in this country and there'd be nobody there you know like sunday mornings and would go see just remarkable art you know albert pinkham Ryder's painting is like okay. always a favorite of mine and it was there but but this is the museum that in my time they bought a praxiteles sculpture so a museum that's capable of buying a Greek sculpture that has a name attached, which is very rare. Mostly it's, it's synonymous. Uh, that's the kind of museum it was. You know, it was operating at the level of the Met in New York. And, you know, my this is where my kids would like, you know, crawl on the rugs on Sundays. And it's like, I love Cleveland for that. Uh, and I loved the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It wasn't most people associate it with the inductions. And for me, it's just this, it's a museum and it's the Smithsonian of rock and roll and rock and roll deserves 20 Smithsonians. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. I was so excited when they finally had gotten it. I've been living in Atlanta for, for decades now, but I grew up in Cleveland. So Springsteen definitely seemed to me like, you know, kind of like religion there, you know, outside of oh, New yeah. Jersey, for sure. Uh, WMMS, I remember like got a yeah. hold of the whole Born in the USA album and played the whole thing the day before. And I was working at a drugstore and I had to make sure to stay in the back to listen to the whole thing. I was just blown away, but I was like trying to act yeah. like an A&R person. Like, what could be a single? I mean, Dancing in the Dark. Okay, that's already the single. What's the next single? I, I picked them all wrong. I thought Bobby Jean might have been or something like that. But wow, I didn't think I'm on fire yeah. would have been a single. Yeah, I mean, it. There was just such an outrageous momentum that um, it's like, you know, Bruce said this in our interviews. He's like, it's like an album of singles. You know, it it was that album. Uh, but, but the way it exploded was just, it was wild. Yeah, I never would have imagined it because he was, he toured in 84 and then he came back in 85. So I'm at the stadium just totally packed four hour show or whatever. It's just like, I was like, just totally taken away. But you know, it's funny. It's like it, compared to Nebraska, it's got a, um, a commercial veneer, but it's still a pretty rough rock and roll record. It's not, you know, it's only by contrast that it looks like it's prettied up and then dancing in the dark, you feel, okay, they're going for a single here, but there's a lot of just, live rock and roll band cutting in the studio like no mistake in it yeah yeah he still does johnny 99 live i was like somehow that gets sandwiched in there because the audience is already into it by the point that he does that so it's like totally makes sense 
just beautiful the audience lines. is into it period yeah. they're, they're, it's, it's <laughs> not do anything on any songs <laughs> all he's got to do is get up on that stage and yeah. yeah this this is where the legacy has taken him and you're you know you're watching it go down in europe right now it's like yeah wow you know this is a stadium artist in his early 70s and it's that doesn't happen by accident yeah yeah oh my gosh yeah nebraska is just one of the many in that catalog still doing great music i i loved his his last and his album of covers and just amazing it's it's very inspiring to see somebody with that kind of energy and still keeps going and the, and the things he's been through and he's been very very honest about dealing with depression and working his way through all of that. Yeah. Well, it, 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 it begs the question of like, does the energy allow him to keep producing this or is the fact that he keeps producing new things, giving him the energy, yeah. you know, because a, lo a lot of people like once, once they can get to the point of taking regular afternoon naps, they start taking them. Do they then need more naps? Uh, quite possibly. So, you know, it's the one part of me thinks like there's a good message in like, if you're an artist, keep making your art. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of these farewell tours, which I don't believe this one is either. Uh, it, it's it's just great to say that in, in somebody who's bucking that trend. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's current. Yeah. And, and connect so much with fans if you see any of those. And there's so much stuff out there on Instagram and all these other places where he really comes up to fans. He hands a harmonica to a little girl. He's just it just shows the humanity. And they're not just some like rock star who thinks he's above it all. He's he really does meld in with the crowd and you feel like he's one of us. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Well, thank you so much for joining me. I really, yeah, really appreciate you. it. Great book. Yeah. Get it wherever you get books. Uh, I downloaded mine, but you know, beautiful hard cover. I'm sure is available wherever you get them. Yeah, thank you so much. Take care. Have a good one. And of note, while talking about Cleveland, I mean, there's some history there. Like I was saying earlier, he uh, Bruce Springsteen was very big. They used to play "Born the Run," and I mentioned this in my uh, my interview with Mark Rivera, who's the saxophone player with Billy Joel. I kind of hit on this. Uh, Every Friday, this disc jockey named Kid Leo would play Bruce Springsteen's Born to Run. And uh, I, I'm sure a lot of people would remember that. He also played the Agora Ballroom in August of 1978. Very classic recording. I know it's out there somewhere. I saw Bruce back in August of 1985 at the old Cleveland Stadium. That was an amazing show. You know, you know, legendary for uh, very, very long concerts and, you know, just an, an amazing entertainer. But if you could check it out, check out the album Nebraska. It really gets down to where it really all started for Born in the USA. He couldn't have done Born like we were talking about. He couldn't have done Born in the USA without Nebraska. It's just uh, great how that that how that evolved. So really, honestly, check it out. Check out all of Bruce Springsteen's uh, releases. They're, they're all unique in their own way. What a great catalog. Anyway, see y'all later. <laughs>